So okay. yeah, throughout the day, like we've had very interesting discussions with uh, about like what what uh, computing is, and uh, we thought that it might be nice to have uh, um, some demos showing what what can be done in a computational cluster. And uh, these are straight out of the like press, so I like they they are. So let's see what, how how much of a demo effect we will get. But uh, so to help me today, uh, we have Thomas Fau. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, I'm a research software engineer at Auto uh, in Richard's group. Um, been there now for three years, and still having fun. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> it's good to hear that you're having fun. Thomas, your sound might be coming from a room microphone. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so so what what do we have for you today? So I prepared two demos. So these are like two demos that might interest in like different people in 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 our audience. So the first demo I will demonstrate. Uh, like how you could run this uh, molecular dynamic simulator called LAMPS, which is, might be physicists out there might be interested in, which uses like a uh, message passing interface from MPI for parallelization. We'll talk about that uh, soonish. So I have here a terminal. It's, it's running on our uh, login node. So these demos are very much uh, like Can uh, afford... demos that... Oh. Yeah. yeah. Are you going to talk about the big picture of what we're doing and what people should try to follow and not try to follow right now? Yes. So so these are very much demos that are like, uh, they are for our site, so they might not work for your site. And these demos are like to, to show what sort of things are capable of doing, um, you're capable of doing in the computing cluster. So I you shouldn't uh, necessarily worry about like uh, write, writing these up or looking, t taking notes or anything like that. What I, what we want you to focus on is the big picture of like, okay, you have a scientific problem, you want to uh, solve it in the computing cluster. So what sort of workflow you might encounter? So, so in this case, let's say we have a, we want to run some simulation with this LAMPS uh, molecular dynamics code. So first off, I would probably want to get the, uh, get the example. So I have prepared this uh, git, git clone command. So what this does is that it, it uh, clones the LAMPS repository, which contains um, the examples that we want to run. On the bottom, you can see history of the commands that I'm running. So there's like a terminal there showing uh, what commands I'm running. So you might encounter this kind of like a command line interface. Like you, this is not this is only one way of accessing the computational cluster, but we'll be working with the command line interface quite soon. But you you can just now limit yourself to the knowledge that I'm in the computational cluster. I'm taking out the demos. And here I have uh, uh, now the lamps folder, and I will go to examples, and we'll, I will try this simple like intendation example. So in this example, we have like a two D plane of atoms where we modify or we make an intendation to this uh, atom lattice by by forcing like a, a spherical uh, indent like indenter into that. Uh, Lattice, and first Actually, of we're smashing something into it. Yeah, we're smashing, smashing atoms, so it sounds better. So I will first modify the input file a bit. I'll actually use Nano for that. Uh, I will make here. I will modify one line that makes certain that we get a dump or or this kind of like output from the uh, demo that we can then visualize later on. So we, we store the atom positions every 250 time steps. So I will modify this file. And what we do in typically in a computing cluster, we'll talk about this in much more detail tomorrow. But what we usually do is that we, uh, we write these uh, 
instructions for the computer, what it should run on the resources, uh, the computational resources. So what I would do here is I'm, I'm going to quickly write this, uh, this script. Maybe uh, Thomas, if you want to explain short, yes. shortly okay. what I'm so saying. Essentially, um, when you want to submit code to a cluster, um, you need to tell it what kind of resources you want. And that's what uh, Simo is currently indicating. So in this case, um, it's using the Slurm scheduler and the Slurm scheduler essentially reads a bash, a bash, a bash script uh, and interprets these comments that are here in the beginning using the bash script, everything that's uh, starting with a hashtag is a comment. And when the scheduler sees, uh, or when the submission system sees this S batch, it knows that this is a command for the scheduler. And here it's, um, this should be running on one node. Um, it should, ha should get 16 CPUs. The memory per CPU uh, should be two gigabytes. So a total of 32 gigabytes. Well, or 16 now yeah <laughs> yeah and it should be running for a specific time after that time it uh, the process would essentially be killed so in this case it's 10 minutes that this uh, will be running at most and below those comments uh, good explanation thank you uh, be, uh beyond those comments we will have instructions that we expect the code to run so commands that we want the code to run so in this case we'll do this module loading we'll talk about this later as well but we will basically uh, load some pre-installed pre software that is installed by the cluster people and and we will uh, we will preload that um, and then we will run it this lamp command with the input that we have let's hope that this works so and to quickly say, so the, the reason why these uh, all of this software is not just available is that um, you want to keep the nodes where these um, tools are running as clean as possible. So if you would install lots and lots of software on all of the nodes, there would be a significant amount of resources already taken up just by though by by that because not necessarily every node has a has a hard drive, and if you don't have a hard have hard drive, you need to store all of these things in memory. And that's why these um, tools are installed elsewhere. So I had a mistake in the in the script. So I fixed that. I had a wrong setting because I, I mistyped it. Uh, after that, uh, after fixing that, I submitted this script to the queue. So in the these HPC clusters, we have a queue. We'll talk about more about it later. That will run it whenever we it finds a correct place for for the job to run. Currently, uh, you can see that actually there's uh, there's an interactive session that I have open on another uh, another place open, but uh, that job actually probably finished. So let's see. Uh, and I just yeah. want to give one more comment here. Um, I'm not sure if the slurm, if oh. slurm, the slurm command as such is available on all clusters because I think that is a script that was created yes. um, in Alto. So um, if you want to do that, there's, uh, or if you want to check queues, I think we are coming to that later as well. Yes, there was one more mistake. I didn't yeah. specify which MPI implementation I want to use. So, but now it run. We can see the output so we see what lumps provides is this kind of like an output but it also provides this uh this dump file that well is a video basically of what happened during the run there's um so, yeah, there's a question, yeah, question. In, in yeah if we could introduce a bit of the background of this script so um why do why do we need this script why can't we just run it here like um well essentially yes. on that command line as it is. Yes, that's that's an excellent question. So the question comes back to what we were talking earlier today about uh, computing resources, because we are sharing resources. We are not running this on, we could run this on our own laptop, but in this case, we want to run it like, this is of course like a bit of a toy example, but if we would be running like an actual simulation, 
we would be it would require a lot more resources and we because we're sharing the resources there needs to be a way of sharing these resources and we'll talk about this tomorrow a lot more how the sharing happens and how the queue system works yeah. but basically there's like a queue system that organizes how the different uh, jobs uh, run and i want uh, i want to add to that so normally or in almost all classes i've seen up until now um, if you connect to the cluster, you are actually on the login node. So if you would run, uh, the, log the login node is kind of the access point for everyone to that cluster. So if you start running code on this uh, directly on that node, you would run it on one machine that is shared by everyone. And very often these, uh, these machines have restrictions, how much uh, resources someone can actually use on them. And very often um, they also have um, kind of automated automated script that kill or stops uh, stop code that is taking too much resources. So running things on the logger node is um, normal uh, is not a good idea uh, or it shouldn't be done. So that's why we uh, need to write this script because the script mm -hmm. has the information on how uh, for the scheduler that Simo mentioned on how to put it to the actual cluster and. Mm -hmm. The, the cluster is not the same here. Um, maybe... Yes, so, yeah. yeah, I would quickly mention that you can think about it more if you look at the script again. Like we asked for eight CPUs and currently, let's say my laptop, I'm watching the, I'm watching the stream currently. Uh, I'm having a Zoom open. I'm, I have some browsers open and anything. If I would run these on my own laptop, my laptop would basically overheat. It's currently running at like about 70 degrees anyway. So it would basically like uh, be game over for that if I would try to run this simulation at the same time while I'm running other stuff. So so that's why I want to run it in the cluster. So it, let's think in, in a like a more, more traditional high performance computing situation where like if you are a physicist and you would want to run this code, but you want to run it in a production size, it might be thousands of times bigger. So then you would might need tens of nodes, hundreds of CPUs to to actually run like a big simulation. So in those cases, uh, yeah, laptop isn't any more an op op like an option to do. But we'll talk about the the parallelization later on. But but. This is like, okay, like if we return back to um, the example, like, okay, like this is all fine and fine and nice that I managed to run it, but okay, if I want to like now see what the result was, like this command line interface is, it might be good for, for programming what I want the, like the computer to do, what I want the queue to do and what I want to run. But if I want to visualize it, this might not be the best option. So for that, at least here in Alto, in other sites, there might be different ones. We have this uh, open on demand. So CSC at least has, has this kind of a service where you can launch like a temporary virtual desktop. Uh, you might have other, like uh, in Alto, there's also the VDI service, but this runs in our cluster that basically provides you a desktop in a, in a browser. So you can visualize the, the results that you have. So let's try that out. So in, over here, I will launch one desktop with one CPU and eight uh, gigabytes of memory. It should take a, like a few seconds to launch. Um, and, yeah, and while we're waiting for that, uh, I want to briefly mention that essentially um, the the layout of the cluster is such that the that the resources are somewhat shared. Um, your lo the login node, for example, has essentially shares the file system with the with the compute node. So anything that you create on the login node, the uh, compute nodes can see. That's how essentially the yeah data transfer. No, it's not really data transfer. It's stored at the same place. It's just a network file system. Yes. And over here, you can notice that I'm now, like the terminal that I'm starting here is, is starting on some PE21. So it's a computing node. So it's one of the like computers that we have in the system. 
And over there, I can start Ovito, which is this kind of like open visualization tool that is often used to uh, simulate, simulate uh, well, various, um, various simulations. So uh, like this among these uh, molecular dynamic simulations. So for so over here, I will browse to the to the folder uh, folder that the simulation was done in. So it was the indent simulation, and I will visualize the the dump file over here. So you can notice that here we have the visualization. So it's basically like this kind of like a, uh, a like a yeah lattice two D lattice of of uh, some atoms that don't move and some atoms that do move. And when we play the simulation, we can see that we can see the um, intendation starting to happen when the when the uh, push comes to solve and and the lattice will move from the uh, spherical indenter. So this would happen like I don't know, like you push something into a metal and that would happen. So this kind of a visualization. So this is just to demonstrate like a workflow that you might have in a computing cluster. So so you do something in the command line or from some other interface where you submit your job into the queue, and it runs on some machine. And once it has run, you maybe use open on demand or some other way to visualize the results or to ex like check the results. And what is the uh, what is the result that you want to have? So, so, um, yeah. So, so this is the kind of like a workflow that that you might have um, uh, in in the cluster. Yeah. So, so there's in the in the simulation. There's a question in the chat. So there's a in. Like you cannot see the indent. Uh, it's it's basically like a some material with infinite density <laughs> that pushes to the like inf infinite force pushes like so that like not nothing cannot go over here. Uh, so it's it's some some indenter that basically pushes the material from that side. Okay, but this is like an example of like let's say this kind of like a traditional physics simulation that you might do in a cluster. Uh, we'll talk about how do you do it in more detail in the coming days. Another uh, example, I hope we are not running out of time or going too much over time, but another example we still have that uh, I want to give is uh, like for the, for the deep learning people or for the um, language processing people so so in many cases you might have a situation that like you want to do you want to utilize let's say the large language models that are uh, available like nowadays available everywhere basically so uh, you would want to do some you want to run some um, queries through a large language model so in this example uh, what i will use is like uh, this already written example that we have done, this uh, large language model example. And what the example does is that it uses this LAMA2 large language model to batch process multiple queries to a large language model. So when people are doing query, like many people are using chat GPT and, and programs like that for that, but they are closed models, so you cannot really know what happens behind the scenes, and you you will just have to like send a request to OpenAI, and they will give you a response of what was the prompt that you queried. But uh, if you like, if you are doing research into large language models, or if you are if you want to use open source alternatives for that, you might want need to run it yourself. But those models are very heavy on the GPU requirements. Like they, they are big models usually. So you'd you'd need a system that has those kinds of resources to do it. And in in our cluster, we have uh, GPUs that are capable of running some of these 
uh, large language models. So in this example, uh, let's go to the batch inference folder. And what we have here, uh, we have this kind of a submission script that is a bit more complicated. But what, what we have here is that we request uh, quite a bit of memory. We request a certain number of CPUs. We request a GPU. And then we use, like uh, here in Alta, we have already downloaded certain uh, deep learning models or pre-existing models. You could download them yourself from, let's say, Hugging Face or somewhere. Uh, but we have already some downloaded models existing. And over here, I we will use an environment that I, ha I have already pre-created uh, to, to run this kind of like an inference script. And this inf inference script is like a Python script that loads the models and it will, it will uh, take some prompts that we have and it will run it through the model. So let's just run this. So this is the kind of like, um, like Simo, yeah, the, you, you have this Python unbuffered in there. Yes. Why? Uh, well, that is that is so that if we want to look at the output over here, uh, it will it will show it to us immediately. Uh, that's normally not like required, but that is that is just uh, so that we can quickly see the output. Like if we, if we would run this in a production environment, that wouldn't be necessary because we would be more interested in getting a lot of questions done. But over here, we for the sake of the demo, we want to uh, get output as soon as possible so that we can see what's happening there. So now it's running on a GPU node. Mm -hmm. Our um, our I, model I... is being loaded and the model is being initialized, and it takes a takes a minute to do that. I would also say that um, this Python and Buffer 2 um, is pretty important if you need to debug. Yes. Because if you have some statement, some print statements in um, and don't have that or tail the print statements to directly write out, you can easily end up with um, code that you think is running but or think is not running anymore but actually ran. Yeah. So so the model run, it produced the output, but the output is pretty hard to read from this. So it, it also produced the output into like a response file. So so in order to to visualize it a bit better, I'm loading this uh JSON uh formatter called JQ and and running this command to to open it up in an editor. So we can see what sort of responses it gave. So, for example, what is the history of the Eiffel Tower, and then it describes in in lots of detail the history of an Eiffel Tower. And these kinds of like batch processing is very important when it, in in our case we had I'm not certain how many prompts we have here, maybe hundred, maybe a few hundred, but uh, like if we want to test out these AI models with thousands and thousands of different prompts, it could get pretty expensive if you want to use, let's say, OpenAI's uh, models, or maybe you want to test out how different models behave, um, how the, what sort of output they produce, or maybe you want to try different things. For these, like, it might be a lot cheaper and a lot easier to do it, this kind of batch processing in the compute cluster compared to, let's say, using an already existing, like, Chat GPT, uh, but they, those are also good ways of doing research. Of course, this is only one way of doing research. But if you need to process a huge bunch of these queries, uh, yes, like this is this is uh, one way of doing that. So, but th this kind of stuff you will be able, or hopefully you will be able to do uh, after this course, or you will know how you should get started on working these kinds of. Uh, examples. But we like there are many questions uh, already in the in the chat about like many of the concepts we introduced here. 
and don't worry like we'll we'll go through the concepts in like better detail or in more detail uh like yeah. during the next upcoming two days we won't like uh, go through them in this one half an hour session and expect that you would need to like learn everything from this <laughs> this was yeah. just a demo this is just the preview to know what kind of things might you might learn um and really to show the point that what we're learning the next few days we're not doing something ourselves but we're telling a computer how to do it and thus we can tell the computer to do it 10 times or 100 times for us automatically okay um with that being said it's a break time so after the break we begin we do a practice connecting to the cluster um but see you then bye bye